Lord, you know. You listen on the place of word. Radio is the best. Absolute grief. Complete grief. They represent um, the world. The Canaanites represent the world, the opposition to God's chosen, to God's elect, um, to God's ways. The Canaanites and their false God system and their, and their just evil, evilness, pure evil. And they always draw the men and women of God away from the true and living God. Today, we delve further into the heart of Genesis. As we contemplate the Lord's intimate knowledge of us, the threads of Joseph's colorful journey we have a pattern that mirrors the redemptive life of Christ himself. Hello, and welcome to Plays on Word Radio, where we discuss, analyze, work, and play on the Word of God. Thank you for joining us on this excursion today. Let's join Pastor Teddy, also known as Fred David Kenny Jr., the founder of Plays on Word Theater, as he does a deep dive into the Word of God. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Josh Taylor and Katie Kenny. Welcome to you all. Welcome back to Plays on Word Radio. Yes, we are continuing with our uh, rolling through the Genesis Joe play, but more than that, rolling through the scripture from Genesis 37 all the way to Genesis 50. We took a break to have a conversation with Scott and Lynn Jackson of the Thrive Leadership Foundation. If you haven't heard those two episodes, definitely go back and check them out. I know you'll be blessed. We are broadcasting from Plays on Word Southern Command in our new, brand new office complex, which doubles as our living quarters. This is also the Calvary Chapel Southport Temporary Staging Office. And uh, that's a whole nother story we'll get into at some point. But yeah, we are down in North Carolina right now in our, br- our brand new, uh, when I say brand new, I mean brand new, Southern Command. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about this and what the Lord's going to do here. And as this um, place of base operations for our southern operations we'll keep you guys posted on what's going on here maybe we'll see if we can post some pictures or something like that we're literally under i don't want to say under construction although the lab is kind of under construction if you could see it you would be like wow this guy anyway we opened up when we when we were started out with our genesis joe study we started looking at the text of genesis 37 and um <clears throat> we ended the episode on the the idea of always always leave space for that for the that phrase but god it's so important to leave room for the lord to operate i mean you don't have to he's he's going to do his thing he's god he can operate around it but it's important for us to have the mindset and to be thinking on the things of god and and pondering and putting him first Whenever we face something, uh, whenever we, in every aspect of our life, this is the amazing thing about God. He's actually, it, can, can you believe this, that the one that spoke and everything leapt into existence is actually interested in the intimate details of our life? I mean, this is amazing. How do I know that? Jesus himself said, our Father knows the hairs on our head. I mean, that's, <laughs> some of us, we're... We're losing. That is a uh, that is a retreating proposition right there, uh, and I'm in that camp. I'm like every time I look, I'm like, wait, what? What happened? What's going on? The older I get, the less hair I have, and now it's turning colors on me. I can't even say now it's turning. It's been turning. I actually I had one gray hair when I was I think 18. I had one gray hair all the way till the age of about 29. It was this one gray, it was the weirdest thing. And then all of a sudden, like just, you know, like weeds in your front yard or something, boom, everything just, it just, the gray hair took over. And I was upset about it until this one person came up to me and said, you know, I like your wisdom. And I was like, what? Huh? What are you talking about? Wisdom. Oh, you're great, you're gray hair. Oh, okay. So 
That's how I get around it these days. Anyway, I digress. Back to our study, though. Genesis 37 through 50. It's basically, this it starts off saying uh, these are the generations of Jacob. Then chapter 38, the next chapter from 37, after Joseph, the whole episode with Joseph being sold as a slave into Egypt, and the, the sons, they take a goat from the flock. Yeah, let me back up into 37 for a second. They take a goat from the flock. They kill it. They shed the blood of that innocent animal. Hmm. And they dip the, the richly ornamented robe, the robe with the long sleeves that pointed to Joseph being special leadership. Even the aristocracy, they, they didn't wear short sleeves. They wore the long sleeves. The commoners and the workers had to wear the short sleeves. So Joseph had the special, special custom outfit that his dad made him. And they took that and they, they dipped it in the blood of that animal. And they went all the way back pretty far. Some of the estimates are like 90 miles. So they went all the way back, brought, you know, and brought this coat back to their dad and showed him the blood. And in his eyes, in the eyes of Jacob, the father, the son that he loved, was dead in his mind. And because his eyes saw the, you know, the blood, he was reckoned as dead. A wild animal surely has torn him to pieces, he said. And he mourned and he was grief-stricken. This deception of the goat, the blood of the goat, uh, the innocent animal there from the flock, this does point to, in the mind and in the eyes of God the Father, Christ the Son, that he, whom he loved, whom he sent to his brothers, whom his brothers rejected, who made you ruler over us? Who's, who's, you know, that's what Joseph's brothers said. It's the same parallel to Christ. And Christ, although Joseph was not technically dead, Jesus Christ was technically dead. These are just types and shadows. You can't expect them to walk on all fours. Some theologians have said. So I should, that's a term. You can't expect it to walk on all fours. It's, it, is, it is a type and a shadow. There are parts of it that point to Christ. It is not an exact duplication. Having said that, Jacob mourned for his sons. Meanwhile, Joseph is, is 17 years old. He's brought into Egypt by the Ishmaelites and Midianites. And we talked about that a little bit last time. How they, even, even the Ishmaelites and Midianites descended from Abraham. They were not Canaanites. Then it's almost like Moses writing the book of Genesis, directed by the Holy Spirit, hits a hard left turn, man, from 37. Then it goes to chapter 38, like, and it just, it's like, it seems like, what, what is what is this story about? What is going on here? Almost as if it comes out of nowhere, but it doesn't. And that's what we can, we can bank on and, and trust. So I'm going to read this, Ch Genesis chapter 38. We're going to roll through this, even though this is not technically, this is technically not in the Genesis Joe play. Um, but it is in the scripture, and it's important for us to have context. And it does, that's part of what we do on, on Plays on Word Radio, man. We can, we can drill down and, and get into the weeds of some of these texts that we can't normally do during the play. I guess I could throw this in the play, but it would, it's, re, it's a little tricky because of the play, Genesis Joe, is really about Joseph. I could mention it, but it would add a lot more time to the play. So I've had to go from 37 to 39. In the play. But here, Genesis 38, uh, I'm going to read here and check this out. Let's see. And it came, to, it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. So this is after the brothers sold Joseph. Joseph sold as a slave. And Judah actually wanted to, no, I'll say wanted to rescue him. Judah helped to save Joseph, his life at least. Judas was sitting there and he said, you know what, Why should, what are we going to gain if we kill our brother? Let's sell him. to." It was Judah's idea to sell him, sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites and Midianites. So when Judah got back with his brothers and they gave their dad that Technicolor dream coat, <laughs> the coat of many colors, uh, which is actually has been is considered actually a bad translation, not necessarily a bad translation, 
potentially wrong translation, not not that it was a coat of many colors. Um, I believe Martin Luther was the one who originated that translation of coat of many colors. They didn't. It's it's difficult in the Hebrew to make out what was so spe- what was the deal with this coat. What was so special about it? In the play, we render it a coat of many colors, but we also say it is a coat with the long sleeves. And I be- I personally believe that's a better rendering of the Hebrew text than me- coat of many colors. I think uh, the coat with long sleeves points to, culturally points to, the concept of Jacob, the dad, favoring his son and giving his son a coat not only that says he's going to be the manager in charge, but he's not the laborer. Um, again, the preference of preferring different children can wreak havoc. Anyway, uh, so he's back. Jude, Judah now is back with his brothers, and his dad is bummed. I mean, he, he's, he's grief-stricken, and everybody tried to, tried to comfort him. He was not having it. And so 38 happens now. Now we go to Genesis 38. So it happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Now this dude strikes me as shady because nothing really good happens with, to Judah. And this guy seems to be around. But anyway, he's an Adulamite. He's, 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 uh, they go back to the Canaanites. He's a Canaanite, right? And this guy's name was Hira. And the, the Canaanites were the inhabitants that were supposed to be expelled later. Now, Canaan, the founder of the Canaanites, the, all the Canaanites go back to Canaan, who was the son of Ham, who was Noah's son. And in Genesis chapter 9, you can read about a, a strange story. But Noah, he got a little too blasted. He, apparently, he learned how to make wine. Well, who knows when they figured out how to make wine? I don't know when they... When they when the first uh, first sommelier was invented, but either way, no one knew no one <laughs> knew enough to make wine, ferment it, and he got blasted off of it. And um, his his grands uh, his his son Ham saw his nakedness, went and told his brothers Shem and Japheth, and they rather than doing what Ham did, they walked in backwards and cover got a um, a garment to cover their dad. And there have been a lot of speculations on this whole incident. How far did it go? What what actually went down? Either way, Noah, when he wakes up and realizes what Ham did to him, he, he pronounces a curse on Ham's son, Canaan. Cursed to be Canaan, lowest of slaves. Right? So he drops the bomb on Canaan. So the Canaanites were the ones... They became multitudes and multitudes of people that filled the the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. Let me back up a little bit, though. Okay, so you have Jacob and his brother Esau, twins. Esau and Jacob, their, their mom and dad is Isaac. So you have Abraham, you have Isaac, and then you have Jacob and Esau. When Esau got married to uh, Hittites, which is part of the, the Can- they go back to Canaan, uh, Canaanites, and um, they were a source of grief, absolute grief, complete grief. They represent um, the world, not those, not just those two. The Canaanites represent the world, the opposition to God's chosen, to God's elect, um, to God's ways. The Canaanites and their false god system, and their and their just evil evilness pure evil. And they always draw the men and women of God away from the true and living God. So Judah, he gets up and basically leaves, not too far away, but he leaves and moves with this guy, um, Hira, the Adullamite. And this says in verse 2, there Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her she conceived, verse 3, she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Er. So, right there, then and there, I mean, there's some things that are a little weird here, because Judah, the tradition was the dad would, or the parents, but primarily the dad would arrange 
the marriage. It happened for Isaac. Abraham arranged Isaac's marriage to Rebekah. But here, here the uh, Judah just goes out and sees a Canaanite woman, and he took her, and it says in verse two, and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and and he called his name. He called his name Ur. Verse four. She conceived again. You know this lady's never mentioned either. I mean, her name's not ever given. She's just the daughter of Shua, who's a Canaanite. They were supposed. They weren't really supposed to be intermarrying. Abraham said to the servant when when he was getting a wife for Isaac, he said, do not take a wife for from, from my son from these women around here. Go back to my area, my, my clan, my family. And so it's, I'm telling you, I think this guy, Hira, the Adolamite, I think he was a bad influence. Verse four, she conceived again and bore a son and she called his name Onan. And so now notice she named the son. The first son, Judah named Second son, she named the Canaanite woman who's not even, we don't even know her name, but she's a Canaanite. And then this, the third son, verse five, she conceived and bore a son again, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chazib, was the town, when she bore him. So between verse five and verse six, there's a, a pretty big gap of time that's happening between verse five and verse six. And Judah took his wife, verse six, and Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. I mean, it was just born. In verse 3, he was born verse by verse 6. He's taken a wife for him. So clearly there was a gap of time here. Enough time. It was uh, 13 years and a day. I believe the Jewish men would be allowed to marry. And we do have young, very young marriages going on in the scripture not a ton, but there's there are um, recordings of it. I mean, Josiah was fourteen when or thir- fourteen when he had his first son. <laughs> I mean, these guys they were the of the king line, so it was no doubt uh, a priority. Okay, well, hey, he's a man now. Let's, let's let's get him let's get him married so we can have an heir to the throne. That type of mentality. So there's a gap, verse six between verse five and verse six. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. So Judah took the wife here for him. Judah went and set this up. Verse 7, but but Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. What? Wow! That's harsh. Well, maybe it's not. The Lord does not play when it comes to wickedness. Now, we're not told what this quote-unquote wickedness was, what offense he committed against the Lord. We're just told he, he was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Verse 8, then Judah said to Onan, this is the second son, he's, Judah says to him, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Verse 9, but Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever, all right, now, you got to love the scripture. It, it, it deals with It deals with everything. You, you just can't escape it. Uh, I'm going to read this. i tell you what. I'm going to read it from the uh, NA, NASB. Um, and I'm just I'm going to read it. It's the word of God. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to have to read it. Verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as her brother-in-law to her and raise up a child for your brother. Verse 9. Now Onan knew that the child would not be his. So when he had relations with his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground so that he would not give a child to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he, meaning God, took his life also. God doesn't really play, I'm telling you. This is, this is heavy. Now, the, On, Onan, the second brother, I personally, I think he was, he was greedy, and his crime was not his physical action or the, the, the physical act of what, what he did. It was, he was not going to allow for his brother's name to be carried on. And one of the potential reasons for that, and the one that stands out, I believe to me, is that the inheritance, if he were to have a son with Tamar, the inheritance was not going to him, uh, to, to Onan. It would go to the to the son direct first directly to the son that they would have in the name of his dead brother so there's that's where the greed kicks in in my view i believe he's you know he's 
He's worried about his inheritance. And, you know, later on, we're going to see throughout the scripture, we see this practice happening, this idea of, okay, so uh, his husband and wife and the husband dies. So then the next brother is to marry the wife, the widow, to raise up children in the name of the dead brother, to keep to keep the name alive of the dead brother. And we see it, we, we see it in the book of Ruth, Boaz, he did it. We see it in the law of Moses. You rewind a little bit. The law of Moses, I believe Deuteronomy 25 talks about it. The Leverite marriage uh, law, it gets codified. And it was a common practice, not just of the people of God and the people of Israel. It was a common practice in that ancient time. Verse 10, though, God put him to death also. Now, God does not play. I mean, he does not play. Even in the New Testament, we have in the book of Acts, Chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira lying to the church and to the to the Holy Spirit. And God took them out. Took them out. But God took them out. God is serious, man. He is serious. He does not play games. Many times people live their life just assuming, ah, I'm good. God's not going to see. Man, this should be a wake-up call. He sees all things. Verse 11 Moving right along. We're running out of time. Verse 11. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, the youngest one, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained at her father's house. So Tamar went back. Now she's basically engaged or promised to get Judah's youngest son, Shelah. And Judah, check this out. Judah, in his mind, he wrongly assigns blame to Tamar for the death of his two sons. He's, he blames Tamar. Wrongly assigns the blame in his mind. And that's why he was like, man, I'm, I'm sending her away. I'm getting her. Uh, my, I'm gonna, he was afraid that, that her, his son, Shelah, would die because of Tamar. But it wasn't her fault. It was not her doing. This was the Lord's operation. We got to be careful on how we assign blame on people in our minds and in our hearts. We don't always know. Now, this whole episode, this whole thing takes place parallel to the story of Joseph when he is sold as a slave into Egypt and he's in Potiphar's house and then he's put in prison and even to the point when he is raised to the right hand of Pharaoh with all power and authority given to him. The story of Genesis 38 is a stark contrast to Joseph. And this is happening so we can see a timeline, a continuation. Of course, we know that the Messiah is going to come from this, from Judah, not from Joseph. The Messiah, Christ Jesus himself, from this episode here. It's amazing, but it's parallel to Joseph's story. Joseph was righteous and honored God. And here Judah was living in his flesh and mingling with the Canaanites. And the promises of God, you know, the promise, it's kind of interesting. You look at Jacob's sons, the firstborn was Reuben, but he sinned. He went up on his father's couch and slept with, with Billa, Rachel's maid, his concubine, causing all kinds of problems in the household. Can you imagine that? Like the kids, her kids, and now he, her, ugh, oh, Jerry Springer, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you have Simeon and Levi because of their sister, their sister Dinah, and the whole episode with Shechem, who slept with their sister. They went and they they, they wiped out the whole town. Like they they basically became murderers. They wiped, they killed everybody, all the men. The blessings aren't going to Reuben. They're not going to Simeon. They're not going to Levi. Judah's next in, in line. And Judah, uh, the world was pulling on him. It's just like a disease. The world system, the things of this world that are anti-God. And that's what the, the Canaanites represent. And this guy, Hira, is, you know, Judah considered him a friend. But this friend, I don't think, was a very good influence. Looks like we're, we're going to run out of time on this episode of Plays on Word Radio. We are going to continue. Just remember, though, this story in 38 is running parallel to Joseph. Uh, when Joseph is is being exalted, uh, all the way to the, where he's being exalted. And it reconnects when Joseph's brothers with Judah go back to Egypt during the famine. And then Joseph 
with all power and authority and glory, re reveals himself to his brothers. And they look upon him. And it reminds me of the scripture in Zechariah. It says, when they look upon me, on him who they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. That day's coming. And until that day comes, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. This program was made possible by the Plays on Word family of supporters. To find out more, check out our website at playsonword.org.